My Apollo 7, we had window contamination also, and unfortunately, the vehicle went into stable two, and the salt water uh, removed most of the samples off the window. Now, we hope that this vehicle will, will not go into stable two, and we can get some good window samples back, and uh, we should have a solution to this problem by the next Apollo flight. Let's see if we can figure out what's causing it and perhaps how to cure it. Hmm? Yes, sir. So, Walter, that's the way it is right now. They're riding down from far out in space, and uh, it's really intriguing that with all this, there still is a mark on the window that Frank Borman has to watch while he flies the thing in, at least partly, by hand and eyeball. Well, I want ...that shows uh, the, the path down through the corridor, the skip-out uh, margin line and the, uh, the too steep line. Could you System, uh, let me back up just a little bit before I get into the scroll. Uh, Frank checked this instrument out uh, yesterday several times and uh, we're convinced it is working properly and he did it again this morning. By going through these different test functions, he has verified that all the lights are working, that the scroll is driving properly, and uh, the instrument is performing the way it should. He then went to range set and he slewed in the range to go. Now this is the range to go from the, ve from the time the vehicle hits 05G, entering the atmosphere, to touchdown point. And for this particular mission, it's gonna be 1,212 nautical miles. So he has slewed that value into the counter. He has then gone to entry velocity set and slewed the, uh, again, this time it slews the scroll and he's aligned the scroll to his entry velocity, which is going to be 36,300 feet per second. He then has gone to entry. Now, that sets the instrument up for entry. So, as the vehicle enters the atmosphere and hits 05G, 0.05G, this light right here will come on. And at that time, he'll throw this, uh, this switch will already be in auto, I'm sorry. This switch will be in auto. And so the accelerometer will sense 05G. And when, when that happens, this instrument starts to work. Now, behind this, film, this film is a clear film with a, an emulsion on the back of it, and behind this film is a, a scribe with a very sharp point on it. This scribe runs up and down depending on the acceleration or the G that the vehicle is pulling. Now, on this particular entry trajectory, we're going to pull about six Gs. Now, that's six Gs eyeballs in, so it's very comfortable to the crew. It's not like six Gs in an airplane where you would tend to black out. But as the vehicle pulls, starts to pull the Gs, this scribe will come down. Also, this instrument is integrating the acceleration, converting it uh, to velocity, and the scroll is driving in this direction. So as the scroll drives across, we get a trace or a, a line cut on the back of this film, which shows up as a red line to the crew. Now, what the crew is trying to do, these lines coming down in this direction are the G lines. And uh, since he is coming in at uh, minus 6.448 degrees, he will have his lift vector up, and he will try not to violate any of these G-tangency lines, if, if uh, he Leo, should. <coughs> Leo, excuse me a minute, but I think we want to listen to mission control here. It's one of the transmissions just before separation. Here it is. Occur. The capsule communicators just been advised to tell the crew we are we are go for that event. This, by the way, will be the fourth. This is the fourth man flight to be returned to the Pacific area. And coincidentally, all of the eight series, Mercury eight, Gemini eight, and now Apollo eight, were brought back to the Pacific area. In addition, Mercury nine landed off Hawaii. Here's some uh, conversation. Uh, Ken Mattingly, our Capcom, is talking to Bill Anders. Houston, Apollo 8, confirm go for pyro arm. Apollo 8, Apollo 8, Houston, your go for pyro arm. Apollo 8, Apollo 8, your go for pyro arm. Everything's looking good. Roger, everything's looking good here, Ken. Pyro arm is the arming of the pyrotechnics that will blow the command module and the service module apart. The 
service module itself will then be given a slight impetus with its own engines. It'll become automatic. Recovery is advising the flight director of their good status. They uh, see good weather out there. They're on station. The, uh, the route of flight, in case you're not looking at a map, will be over uh, northeast China, Peking, and then over Tokyo. And we start a southeastern slant. The ship Redstone is parked at uh, 24 degrees north, 169 degrees east. And the next uh, listening point will be the ship Huntsville, tracking a ship at 172 west, 12 degrees north. And the landing point just a few hundred miles southeast of there at uh, 165 west, approximately 8 north. That point, by the way, is uh, just 600 miles northwest of Christmas Island, which I'm sure has been noted. So to try to resurface, over. We're just a minute and a half from a separation, which is the first essential move maneuver in returning to Earth. The spacecraft could not return successfully Cruise unless the separation takes place. The primary evaporator is dried out, a fact that I'm sure they couldn't care less about. They're about to uh, say goodbye to that entire system and the service module in about two minutes. service module separates, it leaves the command module only to return to Earth. About uh, 12 feet high it is, and that's all that comes back of the 363 feet which were blasted off uh, in the entire rocket system from Cape uh, Kennedy uh, just uh, last Saturday. Yes. As we hear the reports from Paul Haney, the voice of mission control, and also the voice of Ken Mattingly, who is the capsule communicator. He's one of the and late the uh, class astronauts. Is now we see uh, they have gone to ring two. The reaction control system, the system looks quite good. It's operational. There are 200 pounds of propellant available in that system. It is a redundant system. The reaction control system is a system... A few of the events, uh, as we plan to clock them here, the point of 400,000 foot point, which is uh, that point when many of our events begin to happen. We call it the area of reaching some little, small amount of atmosphere. Separation should be taking place just about now. Hours, 46 minutes. Uh, the blackout period should begin about 25, 20... 25 seconds Our later. animation showed the separation at the scheduled time. We're waiting the for confirmation of that from Paul Haney. 46 hours, 47 minutes, and which should occur at uh, roughly 200,000 feet. And at this point, the roller coaster type ride that the spacecraft will take will bend slightly upward for approximately 40,000 to 50,000 feet, then level off and begin its last plunge back. But as it hits the first breaking point at uh, 180,000 feet, the max G-force will be felt by the crew of 6.8 Gs. A second G uh, spike of 4.2 will be noted uh, about four or five minutes later. The total blackout we're predicting this morning is on the order of three minutes. Since we have very little experience re-entering at these velocities, we uh, must caution you that those are only estimates. We're still waiting for the confirmation of the separation, which we showed on our animation at the time it should have taken place, 13 seconds after 10.22 Eastern Time. It's now coming up to 10.24 Eastern Time. Apollo 8, Apollo 8. Your secondary loop looks good. Roger, you.
The uh, communication uh, sounds uh, normal from mission control to the spacecraft, but uh, Paul Haney has not confirmed separation for us yet. Separation did not have to be confirmed by voice loop, uh, the, by the voices of the astronauts themselves reporting in. There is plenty of telemetry aboard which would tell the mission control that separation has taken place. Since we heard that calm voice of Ken Mattingly just a moment ago reporting uh, that uh, secondary loop looked all right, we can assume that everything is going as planned, but we still haven't had that confirmation. And to make us all happier, we'd like to have it. 